I'm continuing a series of messages on uh, daring faith. Daring faith. We all need daring faith. And we're in part four of this series. And this week I want us to look at daring to commit. I want to use that word that's never been very popular with the present generation, actually the last two generations. And that's the word commitment. You know, your life is actually shaped by your commitments. I think you understand that. We become whatever we are committed to. If you don't commit yourself to anything, you become nothing in life because you're shaped by your commitments. You know, great people are just ordinary people who made a great commitment to a cause that's greater than themselves. Nobody is naturally great. You're not naturally great. I'm not naturally great. We're just ordinary people. People become great men or great women of God when they commit themselves to something that's greater than themselves. You and I need a cause that's bigger than ourselves to live for, every one of us. If the only thing you're living for is you, that's not big enough to even get out of bed in the morning. We become whatever we're committed to. And the problem uh, is a lot of people are afraid to make commitments. You're aware of that. And we see that in our society today. We have a lot of people who don't want to commit to anything. And for too many of us, it's kind of like going down a buffet line. You know, I love buffet lines. One of my favorite places to eat. You don't commit too early because there might be something better a little further along. You know how that works? And so you stand in front of the salad area at first and you think, I really don't want to put all that salad in my plate. There may be just something better a little bit further along. And then you go a little bit further down the, to the casseroles and the same thing. You think the same thing about the casseroles. And then you go a little bit further down to the, to the meats. And, and there you think, well, I, I don't know. They don't look all that great. I'll wait for the desserts. So you get down to the end and the desserts don't look that much better either. And so you get to the very end and you don't have anything on, on your plate because you were afraid, afraid to make a commitment as to what you were going to eat. You cannot live a life without making some kinds of commitments. You can't buy a house without making a commitment. You can't buy a car without making a commitment. You can't have a job without making a commitment. So you have to make some commitments. So commitments define our lives. And the key to make, the key in, in life, of course, is to make good commitments, to make fewer bad commitments and to make more good commitments. The Bible says this about commitments. It has a lot to say about commitments. Romans 6.13. Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. That's the highest commitment you can make in life. To give yourself completely to God, to be used for the purposes for which he made you, the purposes for which he created you. He put you on this earth. We've been talking about this over and over again through this series. You didn't just exist accidentally. God put you here and he had a purpose for your life. And it's our responsibility to discover that purpose and go to it. Romans 12.1 says pretty much the same thing. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. That's an interesting phrase. Isn't it? This is your spiritual act of worship. And what I want to do this morning is to talk about how the five deepest needs in your life are met by the five great commitments. God wants us to know him. God wants us to love him, to grow in him, to serve him, and to share with him. And we can call these commitments uh, membership, maturity, ministry, mission, and magnification if we want to. Or we can call it worship, discipleship, fellowship, ministry, and evangelism. It doesn't really make any difference what word you use here. The fact is God has five purposes for your life. But they're worthless unless you commit to each of them. But one of the things I want to point out to you is this. You and I need relationships in our lives. You need a spiritual family. Some things you can only do with others. You can only learn with others. And we're going to talk about those five commitments this morning that we need to make. The first commitment is the one that causes your faith to be strengthened. And unless you make this commitment, your faith will not be strengthened on a regular basis for the rest of your life. Here's the first commitment. Number one, 
Uh, we've got, those of you who may be visiting this morning, we have an outline. Pull that white outline out of your bulletin this morning and fill in the blanks as we go. Number one, to strengthen my faith, I must unite with others in worship. Worship. Worship is for God, but it brings benefits to you. Let me just mention two. It renews your faith and it restores your joy. When you come to worship like this and you get together with other people to worship, it renews your faith and it restores your joy. Let me show you two verses about this. Isaiah 40, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. How many times have you gotten up on a Sunday morning or whatever and said, I am so tired. I really don't have any energy to go to church and go to worship this morning. And yet you went to worship and afterward you were more energized. How many would say, yeah, I've done that before? Yeah. Of course. Because it renews your strength. Amen. You're not going to get your strength renewed just staying home watching uh, baseball on TV. That's just going to make you lazier. You get renewed. Your strength gets charged. Look at this other verse from Psalm 100. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. You know, in the Bible, it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. That's Psalm 122. Not, I was mad. Not, I was sad. Like, oh, brother. Have you ever asked someone to go to church with you and, and they replied, oh no, if I went into a church building, the whole place would fall down around me. That's the difference between a person who knows God and a person who doesn't. I'll let you know my bias. I think it ought to be fun to go to church. That may be shocking to you, but the Bible says I was glad, not I was mad, but I, and I, not I was sad, not I was bored, not I was guilty, not I felt like I had to go out of duty. You know the thing I love about Cactus Christian Fellowship? Nobody comes out of duty that I know of. They're here because they want to be here. And when the service is over, what do you see? I see it every Sunday. People stand around and talk with each other like they're glad to be here, and they're glad to be with one another. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with singing. Those words are important to us. Now here's the second life commitment. The first life commitment gives me spiritual strength. And, and that is my commitment to be in worship regularly with other people. That energizes me. It restores my strength. It restores my joy. Here's number two. To discover my identity and purpose, I must connect with others in fellowship. Fellowship. That's a word that's used in Scripture. I must connect with others for fellowship. We only learn who we are in relationships. Now think about that. We only learn our true identity in community. You'll never learn who you really are by yourself. You only learn it in relationships. For instance, if you had been born and you had lived your entire life to adulthood with no human contact at all, you wouldn't have the slightest idea who or what you were. You wouldn't even know you were a human being. You only know that because you're in relationship to other human beings. You learn your identity by being in relationships. If you had no human contact, you wouldn't even know who you are. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says specifically we need to be connected to God's family. We need to be connected in fellowship. We need to be connected to the body of Christ. That's the phrase that's used for the church. In Romans 12, verse 4 and 5, it says this. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. You need to read that through and think it over. That's kind of obvious, though. My ear only functions and fulfills its purpose by being connected to this body. If my ear was cut off and lying on the ground over there, well, what's the value of a cut off ear? None. I can't function. It can't function. The purpose that God made you for can only be discovered by being connected to the body, the body of Christ. 
If you're not connected to the church, then you're not going to know your purpose. You're not going to know your role. You're not going to know your function. You're not going to know your value or your meaning in life. Your value, your use, your purpose, your identity all comes in relationship to God's body, to God's family, Amen. the church. It's all about relationships. And this, by the way, is when you're in conflict with, uh, is why when you're in conflict with somebody, your life becomes very painful. You know how that works? Everything may be going good in your life. You've got money, you've got health, you, you look good, you feel good, and all these things are going on. Then all of a sudden, you have a conflict with somebody and they criticize you, or they betray you, or they reject you. You have conflict with that person. And all of a sudden, no matter what else is going good in your life, your life goes down because we get our identity and our purpose. We get all of these things in our relationships. And it's why God, once we accept Christ into our lives, wants us to become peacemakers, reconcilers, and people who rather than create conflict in the world, we create harmony in the world. The Bible calls it the ministry of reconciliation. Your job, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, is to make relationships better, not make them worse. To create peace, to create harmony and love, not conflict. God created the church as an agent for reconciliation in this world. God invented the church to be the one place where there's no distinction between how you look, how much money you make, who you are, what your race is, or what you've ever done in the past. That's true in our church. We want our church to look like heaven is going to look. When you get to heaven, everybody is not going to look like you. I hope you understand that. And if you don't like diversity here, you're not going to like heaven. Because in heaven, the Bible says, every race, every language, every tribe, every nation, every skin color, they're all going to be there. You look like you do because God wanted you to look like you. And the person he made sitting next to you, he wanted them to look like that. When you reject some other race or background, you're basically rejecting God's plan. Yep. You're saying, God, you didn't do a good job. Because he made you, he wants you to be you. He doesn't want you to be somebody else. So we are to build harmony with each other. You know, when Christ died on the cross, you remember that story in the Gospels, the veil in the temple was ripped in two. And if you're reading that for the first time, you think, why did he mention that? Well, there's a very important story behind that, which I won't go into at this point. But the moment Jesus died on the cross, symbolically, that wall came down, and now he said, now everybody. He not only tore down the wall, he invented a new organization, or should I say organism, and it's the only organiz organization on this planet for everybody. It's called the church. Whether you're red, yellow, black, or white, all are precious in his sight. The church is for everybody. It's a whole radical concept. Amazing grace for every race. That's the second thing here. If you become a follower of Jesus, you have to commit to that. Here's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now God has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation and the message of reconciliation. Do you think either of these are needed in this world today? Hello. <laughs> Have you been watching the news recently? If anybody needs reconciliation right now, it's in our own country. We have so many divisions in our nation right now between gender, between races, between economic status, between left and right, and Christians ought to be at the forefront saying there's one place where everybody's welcome no matter where they're from. It's the church. We, would be, we should be the place showing love and showing fellowship, reconciling the world unto God. This is the second commitment in life. I, I'll not only worship God, I'll build fellowship among other people because we need each other for fellowship. That's where we find our identity and our purpose.
the only way that we can win, all win, is by standing together. Now the third life commitment is about developing your potential. You will never develop your full potential as a man or a woman until you make this commitment. It's this. Number three, to develop my potential, I must learn from others to grow. There are some things you will never learn on your own. You only learn them in community. You only learn them from others. There are some things you can only learn in a relationship. This is why we emphasize small groups, because there are some things you can learn from a crowd, but there are some things that you can learn. You can't learn unless you're in a relationship in a small group of some kind where your voice is heard. For instance, you can only learn forgiveness in relationships. You try to learn forgiveness and what that's all about without a relationship. It's not possible. You, you can only learn loyalty in relationships. You can't learn that on your own. You can only learn love in relationships. You can't learn that on your own. You only learn it with other people. You can't learn kindness without others. You can't learn faithfulness without other people. You can't learn graciousness without others in your life. You can't learn unselfishness without others. In fact, the most important things you need to learn in life require that you be in a relationship with other people. You can't do it on your own. And I want to build my potential. If I want to build my potential, I must learn from others to grow. And where's the best place to do that? In the family of God, in the body of Christ, in the church. In Ephesians 4.16, Paul says this, from him, that's Christ, the whole body joined and held together by every support, the whole body uh, joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Circle that word grow. You help each other grow. You help others to grow. I help you grow. You help me grow. The people in the row where, where you're sitting around right now, they, they need you. You need them. You need other people. There are many things in life you cannot learn unless you're in a relationship with other people. God wired us this way. I've heard so many stories about this, about people who got in a small group and it all of a sudden got growing. And they were just ordinary people, but in a small group they stepped out in faith. They committed their lives. They commit their time. They commit their talent, their treasure, and they just start growing in an amazing way. Remember when we did 40 Days of Purpose? Some of you were here then, maybe. That was a long time ago. Actually, it was our first small group series that we did. 40 Days of Purpose. And we talked about the three levels of living. You can live at the survival level. You can live at the success level. Or you can live at the significance level. Now, most of the world lives at the survival level. In America, very few actually live at that level because even the poorest of the poor here have a safety net, at least here in America. Most of the world would love to have our problems because it would be a giant step up for them. Survival level means, I don't know if I'm going to have a meal this evening. Survival level means, I don't know if I'm going to have any more clothes than the ones on my back. Survival means, I'm going, am I going to have a roof over my head tonight where I'm going to sleep? Americans don't worry about that generally. So very few really live at the physical survival level in America. Most of you live at the second level. You're at what's called the success level. Success means you've got enough money for options. So after the service today, if you want to go eat, you can go buy it. Only if you take your mother along with you. It may be just uh, McDonald's, but you do have options. If you have any money in your pocket, any money in your pocket, if you have any money in a cup sitting at home, you're already at the top level. The 5% of the wealthy in the world, you just need to realize that. According to the world, you're rich. So you're not at the survival level. You're at the success level. And success means options. I can go to the movies. I can see what I want to watch. And the more that you have, the more successful that you are. But that doesn't bring us fulfillment. And the reason why is that you were made for more than success. 
You were made for significance. You know what that word means. Significance. Significance comes from giving my life away to do something greater than myself. Here's the fourth commitment. To experience significance, I must serve with others in ministry. Ministry. Ministry is just the word for doing good and helping other people. It could be, actually, literally, it could be secular or religious. But in Scripture, it's talking about your relationship with the Lord and helping other people in the Lord. But it means helping people, doing good for other people. I must serve with others in ministry. Significance does not come from status. A lot of people think, if I just have a little hood ornament on my car, then I'm significant. Or if I just wear a certain kind of logo on my shirt or on my dress, I'm significant. No, you're not. So significant, significance does not come from status. Significance does not come from your salary, because a lot of people make a lot more than you do. Significance does not come from sex. You can go from one sexual partner to the next thinking that makes you significant. It does not. Significance comes from service. God wired the universe that we only feel significant in our lives when we give those lives away. You cannot be selfish and significant at the same time. Significance comes when you stop thinking about you and you start thinking about other people and you give your life away in the process. Well, the Bible says it like this in 1 Peter 4.10. Each one, he's writing to Christians in general, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. So the, the talents that you've got, they're not for your benefit. Your talents were given to you to benefit the people sitting next to you. And their talents were not given for their benefit. Their talents were given for the benefit of you. Ministry is the path of meaning and service. Service is the path of significance. You're not going to find it any other way. You're never going to feel as good about you until you start giving your life away. Jesus put it like this. Mark 8.35 for whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. God has a lot to say about serving. And he says we're supposed to do it in a special way. Here's the way, with others. We're to do it together. We're better together. You're not meant to serve God on your own by yourself. You're meant to serve God on a team. You're meant to serve God in a family, in a small group, in a church. You're meant to serve God through relationships, the relationships that you have in Christ. Now, the last or the fifth life commitment is the one that makes the eternal difference. This is the one that you'll be rewarded for over and over again in eternity. It's the fifth commitment, number five. To make an eternal difference, I must join with others on mission. Mission. To make an eternal difference, I must join with others on mission. God has a life mission for your life, and you can only do it in the context with others. A life message and a life mission. God put you here to have a message to the world and a mission in the world. And you do that in context with others. I'm not talking about going on a mission as if you were a Mormon, planning to go somewhere to spread the Mormon mission for a couple of years and then come back home. I'm talking about the Great Commission, as in Matthew 28. Before Jesus goes back to heaven, he gives his last words to his faithful disciples. The last words of people are very important. And the last words of Jesus are called the Great Commission. I mentioned it earlier. It, it's there in your outline. It says this, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. God has a purpose for all of history. And God has a purpose for your life. Why would God give you a purpose for your life that's totally unconnected to his purpose for history? That doesn't make any sense. So somehow the purpose for your life is connected to his purpose for history. 
What is God's purpose for history? He's building a family. It's the whole reason that there's a universe. It's the whole reason that there's an earth. God wanted a family. On earth, that family is called the church. It's also called the kingdom of God. And when everybody has come into that family that God knows is going to say yes, and has made the choice to love him back, then this period of history will be over. And then we'll go to the next phase, which is eternity. So somehow God says, I want your purpose in life to be a part of the big purpose, which is taking the good news to everybody else. The whole reason we have Cactus Christian Fellowship is the Great Commission. It's all about not just loving Christ, loving his family, growing in Christ, serving Christ. It's also about sharing Christ, taking the good news. And it's the best news in the world. Amen. Some have referred to it as the PPH. And you all know what that means. Uh, yeah, I can tell you don't. <laughs> Past forgiven, purpose for living, home in heaven. You want to boil it down? That's about as narrow as I can boil it down. Past forgiven, purpose for living, home in heaven, PPH. Where else are you going to get that? Nowhere. It's the best news in the world. So how does one go about being on mission? Let me ask you this. How many of you have ever read The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren? <laughs> Quite a few of you. Good. Well, he also wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Church. And in the first chapter of that book, he talks about surfing spiritual waves. Let me read you a little bit of it, okay? He says, Southern California is well known for its beaches. It's the part of the country that popularized the music of the Beach Boys, beach party movies, and of course, surfing. Many of our schools offer physical education courses in surfing, and if you take a class on surfing, you'll be taught everything you need to know about surfing. How to recognize the right equipment, how to use it properly, how to recognize a surfable wave, how to catch a wave and ride it as long as possible, and most important of all, how to get off a wave without wiping out. But in all of the courses on surfing, you will never find a class that teaches you how to build a wave. Surfing is the art of riding waves that God builds. No surfer tries to create waves. If the waves aren't there, waves aren't there, you just don't surf that day. On the other hand, when a surfer sees a good wave, they make the most of it, even if it means surfing in the middle of a storm. Only God can create waves. Waves of revival, waves of growth, and waves of receptivity in your own life. And our job, like experienced surfers, is to recognize the wave of God's spirit and ride it. It's not our responsibility to go out into the world and make waves. It's our job to recognize how God is working in the world and join him in the endeavor. At our church, we've never tried to build a wave. That's God's business. But we have tried to recognize the waves that God is sending our way. And we have learned how to catch them. And the amazing thing is this. The more skilled we become in riding waves of growth, the more God sends. And in my opinion, we live in the most exciting time in history and the most exciting time for the church. More people are coming to Christ now than at any other point in history. I believe that God is sending waves of growth wherever his people are prepared to ride them. Let me stop here. It's still a quote from Rick Warren. And I think some of you probably doubt what I just said. More people are coming to Christ than any other time in this world. And you're thinking about all these polls that have been taken about how church attendance is going down and the growing percentage of the nuns in the American culture, those who say they don't need religion in their lives and they're not attached to any church. And you're fearful of the far left dogma that's taking over our schools and taking over the media and taking over the government. And if that is your only thought, then you need to broaden your scope of understanding about what's going on in the whole world. America is just one part of this world. And we Americans just never think of anything beyond our own shores. Yeah. And then let me quote Rick Warren again. So your prayer at the start of every day should go like this. Father, I know you're going to do some incredible things in your world today. 
I'd like to ask you to just give me the privilege of being in on some of them. In other words, stop praying, Lord, bless what I'm doing, and start praying, Lord, help me to do what you're blessing. There's a big difference. When a surfer wipes out because he didn't ride the wave correctly, he doesn't give up surfing. He just paddles back out in the ocean to wait for the next big wave that God sends. And one thing I've observed about successful surfers is that they are persistent. You may have experienced a few wipeouts in your life. I certainly have. And you may have missed a few waves in your life, and I have too. That doesn't mean you should quit. The ocean hasn't dried up. On the contrary, at this very moment, God is creating in the world some of the best waves I've ever seen. Let's go catch them. Would you pray this prayer? Dear God, I want to strengthen my faith. I want to discover my identity. I want to develop my potential. I want to experience significance, and I want to make an eternal difference. So today I want to settle these five life commitments. First, I commit the rest of my life to uniting with others in worship, to strengthen my faith and restore my joy. Then I commit to connecting with others in fellowship, to being in a small group, to being an agent of reconciliation in the world and treating everyone with respect and dignity. And then I commit to learning from others in order to grow and becoming what you want me to be. And I commit to learning to serve you by serving others in ministry and to use whatever talent you've given me, not for myself, but for the benefit of other people. And I want to make an eternal difference and I want to join with others on the mission of daring faith. I want to do, do my part like the little boy who gave his lunch to feed 5,000 people and make a difference in eternity. If you're here this morning and you've never opened your life to Christ, say, Jesus, come into my life right now and save me and change me. I pray this in your son's name. Amen.